Just before I do, I want to remind you, some of you may not have been here yesterday. If you go to philpringle.com or Amazon books, you can purchase uh, and download books that I've written, various books. And uh, I forgot to mention yesterday uh, or the first night that I spoke, uh, the first book I ever wrote was called Faith. And I kind of preached that book here on the first night while well, I preach a, a, a good portion of that book. But I have many friends who say they read that at the start of every year, pastors and, and leaders, just because they feel like there's an impartation, that faith gets inside their soul, and we leak faith. We use it, and we need to revive it all the time. So getting a hold of any of those books on Amazon or philpringle.com will, will, help, will help you. I know that will. The great return. All right. Psalm 126, verse 1. Honestly, one of my most favorite psalms. But then I probably have about 150 favorite psalms. I love, I love Scripture. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done crazy things for them. Yeah, the Lord has done crazy things for us, and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Okay, when the Lord brought back God restores stuff. Not everything should be restored, but there are some things that you and I lose that we shouldn't have lost. Sometimes we walked away, sometimes other people walked away, but God is a restorer. And there are a lot of stories in Scripture when God restored things to people's lives. Job lost utterly everything. He lost his sons, his daughters. He lost his business. He lost his health. The only thing that he didn't lose was his wife. And she kept nagging and nagging him. And he kind of wished. All the other stuff, Lord, but But he remained faithful to the Lord through it all, and husbands and wives. Just a little margin point. God will never be your hitman for you. He has put you together to make you better, not bitter. He's building you. You're getting stronger all the time as you strengthen your commitment to one another. What a good day to do it on Mother's Day. But when Job sought the Lord after a nine-month trial, everything he lost was returned to him. And he even had more daughters, but he had twice the level of blessing that he had before. The prodigal son, he lost everything because he walked away. He walked away from the house. He really wanted to get away from the father, but he knew to do that, he had to leave the house. But as soon as he made the decision to return to the father, he knew he had to get back to the house because he knew he'd meet God again in church. I am completely convinced in the power of the local church. So as he made his way back, it was a, it was a dreadful moment because he's thinking, Oh, I brought so much shame on my family. My father's, he's gonna kill me when I, but I got nowhere else to go. So when he's coming up the road, 
dragging his knuckles on the ground and his shoulders sagging. Here comes his father running out of the house, robes going, beard flying, turban flying off. And in slow motion, you can imagine him just coming. So, man, here he is. And the son is thinking he's going to reach inside his thing, pull out a shotgun. Get off my property, you rotten kid. And the son is seeing his father running at him. He's thinking, oh, no. But there's no shotgun. He's just wide open arms. I'm so glad to see you. And he hugs him. Instantly puts a ring on his finger, which is like your platinum Amex card. You can go anywhere in the world, poof, buy your Lamborghini, poof, buy your house with that thing. He put the, the jewel-encrusted robe all over him, which was reserved for VIP guests. Put sandals on his feet, which is kind of interesting because in the Old Testament, when people got close to God, God said, take your sandals off. But in the New Testament, we're not standing on our righteousness. We're standing in an imputed righteousness from Jesus Christ. Put the righteousness on and you're completely right with the Father. So the Son was completely restored with a party. And in honor of the mums today, I thought I'd tell one other story about a woman called Naomi in the Old Testament in the book of Ruth. And Naomi had a husband whose name is Elimelech, which translated in the Hebrew means idiot. No, it doesn't, but it should. Cause when things got tough in Bethlehem, Judah, which means house of bread and praise. It's the church. When things got tough down at the house of bread and praise, Elimelech said to Naomi, we're out of here. And he led his family to Moab because there was a famine in the house of bread and praise. Can I just stop here, pause here for, for a second and say, you know, no matter what, the norms are in our culture all around the world. Often we find mums have, have assumed the leadership, the spiritual guidance and the spiritual responsibility for the family. So dad says, oh, mom's gonna take the kids down to children's church or mom's gonna look after the Bible reading uh, and then come to say grace around the table. Mom, what do you want? You know, mom says, oh, can you, one of the boys say, can I say that when we get to heaven, God is gonna to say to each of us who are fathers and husbands, you were a priest to that little family. You were a priest to mediate and pray to me for them and guide them in their spiritual direction. And for some reason, the devil has completely attacked that concept. And we have husbands who are so weak in their own home, afraid to make a decision because it gets contested. Can I say to husbands and wives today, let's, let's get it together like, and, and let men take that priestly role they've got in the house and start to pray every day for your family. Even if it means getting up a little earlier than everybody else in the house and crying out to God saying, God, bless my wife. Bless my kids. Lord, you're gonna hold me responsible. I wanna make sure that I am discharging that responsibility as the pastor of my own house, as the church in my house. And Jesus is in our houses. He's in a, an ordered structure. So this guy, Elimelech, does the dumbest thing a father and a husband could do is lead the people away from the house of God lead his family away. Never in our house on a Sunday has it been, shall we go to church today? That's not a question. That's like saying, shall I 
Shall I eat breakfast? Shall I have a shower? Of course you should in this heat. Shall I, I mean, shall I breathe? Church is not a like, oh, maybe we'll do it. It's, it's, it's a rhythm of life that we rotate around. We don't let it rotate around our agenda. The house of God becomes a central point. It's our family. So he has got, taken them down to Moab and his two boys marry two local Moab girls. And one is Orpha, the other is Ruth. Their names are Marlon and Chilean. Their names mean sickly or pining. One name means sickly. I don't know why you would name your kids that. Out comes this first kid, ooh, looks a little sick. Let's call him sickly. Here comes another one, looks depressed. Let's call him pining. But these two kids, they grow up with those names. That's their identity, sickly and depressing. They marry these two girls, and within the first year, bam, Elimelech dies. Just drops dead one day. Within a little while, the two sons also go. They die. Naomi has lost her whole, her whole world, her whole family. She says, I'm done with this. I'm going back to the house of bread and praise. Orpa says, see ya. Ruth says, I'm coming with you. Your God will be my God. I've seen the way you handle pain. I've seen you walk with elegance and dignity through the worst of troubles. I like you. I like your God. I'm coming with you. She says, no, stay. She says, oh, I'm coming with you. There's no way I'm staying here. So they come back into Bethlehem, Judah. And the first day they're there, Naomi sends Ruth out to gather grain in the fields of a guy called Boaz. He might not be the best looking character in town. He's kind of old, but he's rich. He's got it, baby. And he sees Ruth and his heart's beating in his chest. So, whoa, because she's just dropped dead gorgeous. And he's going like, yeah, I'd like one of those. Amen. So he says, he goes through this whole thing where he arranges to marry her. It's too complicated to go through the whole thing. But he marries her. And then he says, all the profit that Naomi lost during her years in Moab, that Elimelech forced her to lose by taking her away, we're going to recover everything into your bank account. All the blessings that you missed out on while you were away in the land of Moab, we're gonna bring it back to you in Jesus' name. And so any mothers here today who feel like you've lost stuff over the last few years, whatever it is, you're in a house of covenant here today. It's covered by the blood and the power of Jesus Christ. And in that blood is the restoration of all things that have been lost. They're gonna come back into your world. And everybody said, Amen. So here is, here is what the psalmist is saying when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion. He's really talking about the return of the Jews from Babylon. Way back in the, in the days of the prophet Jeremiah, he had seen this coming, that they would be taken to Babylon for 70 years. Let me um, show it to you in Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word to you and cause you to return to this place. So this is a prophet saying, guys, you've been misbehaving. You've been behaving really badly. God is upset. He's gonna kick you out of your land for 70 years. You're going down there, then he's gonna bring you back. Okay, they didn't believe him, but, and they persecuted him and gave him a rough time, but his word still stood. They got taken down to Babylon. They're living in Babylon, and there were three or four young boys. You remember Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? 
Well, there's also a young man called Belteshazzar, but that's his, Hebrew, that's his Babylon name for his Hebrew name, which was Daniel. Daniel was about 10 years old when he went to Babylon, but he had a beautiful spirit. He had insight into dreams, and he grew, and King Nebuchadnezzar had him come on as a counselor. Then Nebuchadnezzar got beaten by Darius and the Mede, and then you get the Persians, and finally you've got Cyrus, the king of Persia, four kings, and they kept Daniel on every day, every time there was a, a transition to a new king. One overtook the other. So here is Daniel, and he is reading Jeremiah's prophecy while he's in Babylon. They've been there 70 years, 69, when he reads this. Daniel 9, verse 2 to 3, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So he sees in the Bible, and he checks his calendar, and he goes, whoa, time's up. This is the 69th year. I'm going to start praying. That gets him into all sorts of trouble, thrown into a lion's den. But he keeps praying, and he gets taken out. So Daniel starts to pray for this to come to pass. And then he finds another prophecy by Isaiah, which is like 150 years before, where Isaiah is saying, Cyrus, my anointed, will send my people back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And here is here is Daniel serving King Cyrus. And he says, King Cyrus, I've just read a prophecy about you by a prophet in Israel 150 years ago. He says, what's it say? He says, you're gonna send all the Jews back to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. He says, well, that's amazing. And he says, look at all these other things. It says that God gave you this country, this country, this country. All your victories are because of the Lord. And because of that, you really should build his temple. He says, absolutely. I'll fund the whole thing. I know I'm a pagan, idol-worshiping king, but I am gonna build Yahweh's temple. I'm gonna send all these people back. 60,000 are gonna be sent out of my kingdom to go and rebuild the temple of Jerusalem. That's why they said the Lord has done crazy things for us. He's taken a pagan king and made him build the church of God. I believe that this church, Favor Church, will be funded by people who do not even serve the Lord to build the church, to build the house of God. And you will, with the Psalm 126, people say, the Lord has done crazy things for us. Not only has the wealthy helped us build, the government have helped us build. The officials have helped us build. In a day when opposition against the church has never been more fierce in the Western world, even now God is gonna turn it around and restore the blessing so that the church, which is declining in some places, will expand, enlarge, increase in the land of the Philippines. In Jesus' Name. Woo! The Lord has done crazy things for us. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we got our dream back. Oh, I feel like falling over again, but it takes too much effort to get up. The pastor's worried. <laughs> when people are oppressed, they don't dream. If you've got no dream, maybe depression has crushed it. Everybody must have a dream. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you through the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in hope by the Spirit of God. Here's the thing. If the Holy Spirit is on you, you'll have vision. It's one of the first things that comes into your life when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. If you're set free from demonic strongholds, you'll dream about your future. You'll be dreaming about a business. 
You'll be dreaming about another opportunity. One of the businessmen in this church said he's gone to New York recently and was very nervous because it hadn't been done before. He was attempting to do something. If you're here this morning, sir, let me tell you, you've not got a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, and you will be blessed with an abundance as you take the step of faith. And even though you do it afraid, the power of the Holy Spirit will bless you 10 times more than you even anticipated the blessing would be. No, not just 10 times, 100 times more. You will be shocked, amazed, and surprised at what God can do when you take a step and you dream again. What's your dream? Could you write it down? Could you write one dream down, two dreams, three dreams, four dreams? You might be dreaming about getting a house. Some of you are dreaming about owning three houses. Some of you are dreaming about owning a hotel. Some of you are dreaming about setting up missionary medical stations in poverty-stricken areas. Some of you are dreaming about building a new building. Start dreaming because all your dreams, God will do exceedingly abundantly above every one of them. But if there is no dream, there's nothing to do exceedingly abundantly above. Dream a dream. You say, what if I get my hopes up and it doesn't happen? What if it does? Of course you're gonna have emotional crashes. Of course you're gonna have moments of failure. But that's where we build resilience, to get up again. To get up again. You don't get trophies for participation. You get trophies for getting up again and winning. God gives birth to winners. You are a winner. No, I, no, I mean it. You are a winner. I, I don't think you understand what I mean. Because I'm, ju I'm just going to explain something that's a little bit indelicate. But bear with me. When you were conceived, I asked a gynecologist once, uh, how many male sperm are released at the moment of conception, he went, whoa, 500 million? I jumped around the room. He said, what are you happy about? I won. <laughs> I won my first race, people. So did you. If you're born of God, you're born as a winner. You are born to win. You're born to win. You're born to win. He doesn't give birth to you and say, whoa, I hope this guy fails. He has not got that intention. He only wants you to win. Dream the dream of a winner. See yourself crossing the line. See your bank account full. See your family happy. See your houses built. Dream it. He's the God of hope. He's the God of all dreams. And then it says that our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Well, we talked about laughter yesterday, so I'll kind of skip that, but it's pretty important that you laugh because it's like medicine. It releases chemicals through your body. Good ones. But singing, you never want to underestimate the power of a song. Never underestimate the power of your praise. There are a couple guys in the Bible, you've probably heard of them, Paul and Silas. Well, they were wanting to go into Asia and go into these other parts, the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 go down here. So they end up on the edge of Europe and this guy in Macedonia says, come over and help us in a vision. And so they go over to Philippi and they, they move in the power of God and they bring deliverance to people. But the locals hate it. So they got whipped and beaten. And they were thrown down into the darkest dungeon in the entire prison system. And they were put in, in stocks, arms here, legs there, laid out with bleeding backs in the darkest, lowest part of the Philippi jail. Backs are bleeding into the mud, cockroaches crawling all over them, rats gnawing on their skin, 
It's, it's not a good scene. It's midnight. You're amongst a bunch of other prisoners, people who commit all kinds of crimes. You haven't really committed a crime, but you're, you're in there with them. Well, you could imagine Silas saying, well, this is how God treats us. We serve him. We're faithful. I paid my tithe. And here I am, locked in stocks with cockroaches and rats all over me. A back that's bleeding. I'm in pain. We don't even know the language, Paul. But they didn't do that. The Bible says about midnight, they began to sing. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great. He's not singing. Is our God. Oh, with me, how great. How great is our God. Just two voices in the prison. Our God, sing with me, our great. And I went through the whole prison just like this. Well, friends, that little song grew wings. It flew up out of the bars of the prison, went out under the door, over the wall, up past the clouds. Up past the stars, up to these huge doors. And angels looking down say, hey, these are the gates of heaven. What are you doing? I'm a little song from Paul and Silas, song of praise. Oh, that's great. We open the, we open the gates for praise. Amen. Come on in. So this little song goes, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is David. Nice song. He's walking up Main Street, heaven. This little, new little song. Comes up before the throne. There are these seraphim, huge creatures, angels, six wings. Two over there, one in the middle, down their feet. And they're going, holy, holy, holy. They're singing. And they say, who are you? He says, oh, I'm a little song from Paul and Silas. How great is our God. Sing with me. They go, a new song. Oh, that's awesome. We've been singing this one for aeons. Amen. Forever. So they start singing. How great is our God. And they put a little rhythm to it. Sing with me, how great. They go like that. God hears this. He loves it. He's sitting there. How great, how great is our God. Oh, he likes it so much. Do you know the Bible says heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool? He started tapping his foot. How great is our God. He's gone. And on earth, he's gone. <laughs> Huge earthquake happens. Now, this is theologically correct. Everything I've just said is perfect. The deal is, don't underestimate the power of you praising God. When you worship, you break prison walls down. You open prison doors. You break the chains of darkness over your life. Don't let the devil steal your song with criticism or complaining or moaning or groaning. Fill your mouth with worship. Fill your mouth with praise. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who sang again. We began praising because down in Babylon, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, there we wept. We remembered Zion. They hung our harps on the willows. We had no song in a strange land. We had no song when we were in bondage. We had no song when we were oppressed. But I tell you people, as soon as you get restored, 
you're singing praises again. You've got your song back. You get your song back, you get your praise back. And if you've lost your praise, get it back today. Get that garment of praise on for the spirit of heaviness. I know some of you think if I reach for a pill, it'll remove depression out of my mind. Listen, reach for the garment of praise. When you put praise on you, you will lift the garment of heaviness off you. It is no match for the praise of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you this, don't just praise God, praise Jesus. Because there's power in that name. I had a friend who went through depression and somebody saw a vision of them seeing a vision and they were saying, I'm so depressed. I feel so bad. I feel so lonely. I feel so isolated. Nobody, I just don't feel like I've got any future. He's saying this. And his eyes were open and he saw demons standing around him. And they had clubs. And they're going, yeah, that's right. You have no future. Yeah, that's right. You are no good. Yeah, that's right. You're beaten. You're defeated. You're going nowhere. This is what he's saying with his mouth. He's hearing it in his head. He thought that was true. But then he saw another circle of angels of God surrounding him. And they looked discouraged. The head was down. They had swords but their sword was on the ground. And he saw this and he knew instinctively, I need to start praising Jesus. I need to start worshiping God. So he lifted his hands and he said, God, I praise you. God, I praise you. God, I praise you. He just started praising God. These demons looked smaller, started shivering, and the angels lifted their heads up pulled up their swords and came in and scattered the enemy. People, when you lift up the name of Jesus, you will scatter the enemy. You will lift depression off your mind. You will lift hopelessness out of your heart. You will lift defeat out of your spirit. You're born to win, not to lose. God has put a powerful weapon in your hand called praise by which you pull down strongholds and you elevate Jesus. Don't let the devil steal your song, people. Amen. Complaining, people, is the language of victims. Praise is the language of conquerors. Bring back our captivity, Lord, as the streams in the south. He was talking about people flooding Jerusalem again like the rivers would flood the, the riverbanks, the riverbanks of the desert. When, when the snows began to melt, they would have flash floods. Okay. Uh, I've got a sauna going on in there. Excuse me for a minute. I need to use this. It's got fill on it in here. I guess this is mine. Oh, there's people out there, right? Okay. So, when I spoke the scripture just 10 seconds ago, they're talking about streams flowing in the desert, but actually they're talking about He's, it's an image of people filling the streets of Jerusalem that were empty. It's like there are going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people filling the streets of Jerusalem, which has been like a ghost town. And that's my prayer for the church around the world. The churches that have been like ghost towns, nobody in them. For years and years and years, maybe 70 years like Jerusalem. But suddenly we'll see a flash flood, people, all around the world of thousands and thousands and thousands of people filling churches in Manila, filling churches in Indonesia, filling churches throughout the Southeast Asia region. If ever there needs to be a time where we see revival, it is in this region of the world. Too many of these nations 
have less than 1% of a Christian population. We aim to change that. We need to change that. So that all through the Middle East, all through this region, we see literally thousands of churches of thousands of people filling the streets with worship, not with protest, with worship, filling the streets with the name of Jesus, not the name of protest, but the power of God is gonna come upon the church and upon James and Kate Ayton, and they're gonna see revival, <coughs> fill the streets of Manila, church after church after church after church after favor church. Favor is on you people. The blessing of God is gonna take you further than you ever dreamed you could go. <coughs> Excuse me. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless, without a doubt, come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. We all went through COVID. And some of you went through COVID and you were finding it hard to give and tithe, but you still did. You did it with weeping. It was painful, but you maintained your commitment to the Lord without a doubt. Those tithes and those offerings with tears soaking them are gonna come again. The law of the harvest is that you will reap. And I declare it over you right now that you will reap a harvest a hundred times what you have sown in times of pain and difficulty and challenge. It's not always easy to give. It's a challenge. It's a stretch. But you have given. And you are doubtless going to come again. People carrying an abundant harvest with you. Before I come to a close here today, I want to just thank God for that psalm. Can we just say thank you, Lord, for Psalm 126 that gets us back everything we've lost. It's a psalm of recovery. Come on, give the Lord a clap offering and magnify Him. Thank God for a psalm of restoration, a psalm of recovery.